What did I ever do to you to, to make you treat me with such disrespect? That you come here on the day of my daughter's wedding and you ask me to do murder. You don't even ever ask me over for a cup of coffee <laughs> or a glass of wine. Hey there, and welcome back to Cinema Vino with Marcos Efron. Now on this episode, I'm gonna sit down with director Eric Bross, and we're gonna talk about what is arguably one of the greatest movies ever made, 1972's The Godfather. It's directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and it's based on Mario Puzo's sweeping saga of the Corleone family. Now Eric is what you would call a true filmmaker. The guy lives and breathes movies. He made a huge splash with his directorial debut, the indie sensation Ten Benny, which introduced the world to a young actor named Adrian Brody. Now, since then, Eric has gone on to make other features and direct television and commercials and a ton of other work, including last year's political thriller, Affairs of State, starring Adrian Grenier and Thor Birch. Links to his movies are down below. There's no doubt that there are a ton of great Italian wines that we could have while talking about The Godfather. But Eric and I thought it was only fitting that we would have a wine made by the film's director. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be the Director's Cut Merlot made by Coppola Wines. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You've probably seen his wines on store shelves and thought, okay, it's a vanity label, it's a wine made by a famous person. But these are really good wines, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise considering he puts as much attention into his winemaking as he does making films. All right, so Eric and I are gonna pour ourselves a glass of wine and we're gonna talk about the king of all mafia movies, The Godfather. So you know what to do. Pour yourself a glass of wine or maybe a shot of Sambuca. And if you haven't yet, hit subscribe, turn on notifications, and if you like the video, hit like, comment down below. Always love to hear what you guys have to say. Salute. Thank you for having me, Marcus. Yeah, you were definitely one of the top people on my list to do this. Um, Thank you. You know, this is a channel where I talk about wine, I talk about movies, and I talk about filmmakers, and we talk about the craft, and we drink a little bit of wine. I love movies, I love wine. Then we're gonna have a great time. <laughs> um, you know, actually, it's funny, because I, I knew your name before I knew you, because oh. uh, we, we talked about this. You mentioned this before. Yeah, mm. I worked in the mailroom at the management company that you were represented at, and I used to see your name all the time. I'm like, okay, Eric Bross, I don't know who that is. And then when I met you, I was like, I know that guy. <laughs> now, as a director myself, I'm always interested in how people get into the profession. You know, there's a million ways in, everyone's got their own path. What inspired you to become a filmmaker? My path was drugs, basically. Uh, no, I joke, but not entirely, because actually when I was 13 years old, I, I was smoking pot, I had hair down here, and I was playing in a rock band, playing drums. And I had a bad experience smoking pot, and I quit smoking pot entirely, and I, discovered movies, or at least I discovered making movies. I got my first movie camera for Christmas from my father. And I remember looking at the first movie I made and just, it was just like magical. And that was it, that became my new drug. <laughs> okay, well like, <laughs> then moving on to the next question. No, no. In all truth, that's real. <laughs> Actually, that's not far from the truth, but I always loved movies. When I was a kid, I grew up, you know, you all, we all grew up with films, and or at least most of us did. And uh, my sister Jennifer and I, our first, you know, I think my first experience, obviously everyone goes to like some movie that they remember. And for me, it was, I think it was The Sound of Music. Later on, when I got older, my sister and I would, there was an old theater, movie theater, and we'd go watch like a Marx Brothers film festival. Like they'd have duck soup and it, horse feathers and, and you know, Night at the Opera, or they'd have like the Beatles, three Beatles movies in a row. And we, we, we'd be up to like midnight watching. You made a big splash at Sundance with your directorial debut, Ten Benny. What was that experience like? That was pretty crazy. I mean, it actually it actually took us five years to get that film made. From the time I met my writing partner, Tom Cudworth, we started working on it together. And it took us five years to get the movie made, and it first premiered at the LA Independent Film Festival, the first LA Independent Film Festival. I was getting calls from all over the place, all over town, and I signed with CAA. And then we screened the film for at the Independent Feature Film Market in New York City, where the guys from Sundance, they saw it and were like, we want your movie. You know, you say a movie took you five years to get mm -hmm. made. To me, that sounds actually not that long. <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, by today's standards. By today's maybe, standards, I, you know, and anybody who's watching this channel who's perhaps mm -hmm. thinking of making a movie, you know, 
Let me just tell you, five years is not that long to get an independent film made. So just hey, FYI, temper your expectations. Let's go ahead and open this wine. Um, you know, we're here to talk about The Godfather and uh, in honor of the director, Francis Ford Coppola, we've got his uh, director's cut. Now, okay, it's a little bit on the nose, but you know, when it's right, it's right. And that wine happens to have a great nose, by the way. Indeed it does. All right, let's go ahead and open this. Let's do it. All right, my friend. Salud. Salud. Chin chin. Chin chin. Mm. Ah, that's a fine wine. I like that. So, The Godfather. What is it about this movie that has stood the test of time? I mean, the movie is almost 50 years old. What is it that just resonates? And what is your favorite scene in the movie? Boy, that's a big question. But I, I, I believe the thing about The Godfather that makes it such a timeless classic is that it's the story. In a way, it's the story of a family, but it's also a story about America. It's both realistic, but also mythical. It has stories in it that we can relate to because we know Sonny, we, we know Michael, we understand the family values that, that Don Corleone has. But at the same time, we also understand the ruthlessness of that family, and we relate to that. Everything in that movie has this incredible sense of tactile and auditory, and um, I guess you can smell and taste it is what I think. And that all has comes from the director of that, and that uh, incredible uh, uh, influence that Coppola's Italian-American heritage uh, brought to the film. Yeah, I, know, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, mm -hmm. the characters, like you said, they're fictional, but they're so realized, they're so full of life yeah. that you forget that so that the greatest actors on earth are playing these parts and you yeah. believe that Marlon Brando is Don Vito Corleone. You believe yeah. that James Caan is, you know, Santino or Sonny. Yeah. Um, and it just, I, it's one of those movies that, you know, you look at it and there's a lot of people who maybe haven't seen the movie or they haven't seen it in a while. Which I find shocking. Well, it's three hours long. <clears throat> and I tell you, I, I recently rewatched it just in preparation for our, yeah. our interview. And those three hours just fly by, whereas oh. I've seen movies, I've clicked on movies on Netflix or Prime that are 90 <laughs> minutes and they're interminable. Yeah. So, all right, well, what is your favorite scene in the entire film? Well, boy, this is a movie that in which I have so many favorite scenes, but if I have to choose one, which is also very apropos for the, the theme of your show, is the scene where Michael assassinates the Turk, Salazzo, and McCluskey, the corrupt uh, cop. Played He's by the great Sterling Hayden. Sterling Hayden, of course. It, it's the fulcrum of the movie where everything changes. Michael becomes, his character has a character arc, and the movie totally shifts. Anyway, they, they're at this restaurant, and the tension that is built in that scene, starting with the waiter opening the bottle of wine, where Coppola just lets that scene play out. He's just, you see the entire process of a bottle of wine being opened and poured, and you see the impatience on Salazzo's face, waiting to start to have this conversation with Michael. Then, of course, the scene really elevates to a new level when he goes into the bathroom. First off, is the gun gonna be there? He spends his time looking for it, and what Walter Murch, the editor, does, which is incredible, is that he takes the sound of the L train. You never see the L train, but you hear it, and it, it starts to build up in that scene, and it plays as its own kind of crescendo, and then he comes out of the bathroom. We know he's got the gun now. He comes out, he sits down, and the whole scene now focuses and locks in on Michael, who is just listening. That's all he's doing. Walter Murch takes the sound of that L train and just starts to build it slowly and build it and build it and build it louder and louder and louder to that moment where Michael stands up and assassinates Salazzo and McCluskey. And it's just devastating. And then, of course, he gets up, they, they hit the table, he gets up, he walks away, he drops the gun, and the music just comes in. It's just, it's genius. Everything about it. There's so many great wine moments in that movie. I can give you many moments of You know, like, like the best, I think one of the funniest is the Clemenza in the wedding. He's got the big, like, you know, cafeteria pitcher of wine. wine. <laughs> hey, bring me some more wine over here. And he drinks it down. Okay, so keeping on the theme of wine, I personally like the Coppola line of wines. So do I. 
And there's quite a variety of them, including the Merlot that we're drinking right now. There's a Claret, there's a Chardonnay, there's a sparkling wine. Um, and I think they're really good. Now, the big question though is, do you think it's worth the extra two or three dollars that you're paying for the Coppola label? For me, I think it's a terrific, I think he makes terrific wines. And, but I tend to be a cinema sentimentalist. Uh, I, what can I say? Um, I'm a bit of a sentimentalist when, I come, when it comes to my children. I, I spoil them. They, they speak when they should be listening. That, of course, is a quote from The Godfather. But no, in, in all seriousness, I, I think the same kind of care and sort of tradition that he puts into his movies, um, he puts into his wines. You, you can taste it. They're very fine wines or an upscale wine. And uh, personally, I, I really enjoy them. I, don't, I obviously drink other wines too, but... The fact that it is by Coppola and that family name does tend to uh, work on me a little bit. You know, he has been making wines as long as he's been making movies almost. This is true. He actually bought his first vineyard in 1975. That's right. Up in, up in Sonoma? Napa. A Napa. Napa. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, you did just throw out a quote. And you somewhat are known for having an encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of movies. Yeah. Um, so... I've got a proposition for you. What I've decided to do is have a little fun. And as you can see, I've poured us seven shots of Sambuca, which is a lovely Italian licorice flavored liqueur. Um, so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna read you quotes and you're gonna tell me which movie it's from. Some are easy uh, and I'm sure you're gonna get them, some a little bit harder. Here's the deal, you get the quote right, I drink a shot. You get it wrong, you drink it. Great, and of course, you have to sh choose sambo Sambuca. I, I don't like licorice, but I do like it for <laughs> sipping, but in this manner, it's gonna be interesting. Okay. And in certain cases, I think where it can help or hurt, I don't know, I will try to do the accent or the voice of the person who gave the line, uh, but no promises. Oh, that's not gonna be good. All right. Okay. So first one, Go. so easy. Go ahead. Charlie Don't Surf. Uh, that is from Coppola's uh, Apocalypse Now. Correct. There you go. Salute. Charlie, don't surf. Oh, boy. Ooh, all right. Nice. Well done. Number two. Go. Oh, you're going to get this one, too. Oh, shit. The light that burns twice as brightly burns half as uh, long. And you have burned, oh, so very long. So very, very, very brightly, brightly, Roy. Roy. That is Tyrell, Dr. Tyrell from Blade uh, Runner. Right, right, there you right, go. Right. Have another. <laughs> I love it. That's uh, <laughs> Excellent. Oh my God. Uh, you're going to get this one too. All right. <laughs> love it. A hobby is supposed to pass the time, not fill it. A hobby is supposed to pass the time, not fill it. Oh, wait. Oh, damn. I know that. I don't know what that is. Shit. Psycho. Oh, damn it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pick your poison. <laughs> oh, the, there's not really a voice to this one, but I'll try to give it the same attitude. Go ahead. All right. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. Uh, breakfast Club. Ah, <laughs> <damn it. laughs> mm. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do the accent for this one. You'll know the actor, but I don't know that you're going to get the movie. You might. Okay. I eat green berets for breakfast, and right now I'm very hungry. Oh, that I well, yeah, I know who that is. I eat green berets for breakfast, and now I'm very hungry. Oh, fudge. Well, let's see. It's Schwarzenegger. I eat, I'm going to have to guess a movie uh, with Schwarzenegger that's obviously a war film of somewhere he's doing battle with green berets. Like, I have a feeling I'll be drinking some more Sambuca here. It's not Terminator, obviously, because he's not playing a robot in this whatever you're doing. Stall all you want. Ah, uh, shit. Schwarzenegger, uh, 80s, it's gotta be from the 80s. Uh, oh, uh, I don't know. It's not Terminator. I'll just say Terminator, but I know it's not. Commando. Commando, I don't even know that movie. Ah, uh, Hell's Bells. I told you those 80s movies. I those <laughs> I know, 80s action you... movies, you bastard. That's why I chose it. Okay, here's one. Go ahead. Any man don't wanna get killed, better clear out the back. That that sounds like um, an Oliver Stone movie. Now, I, I will say I didn't quite do the voice as I should have. Can you do it again with the voice? I might give it away. All right. Good. Any man don't want to get killed. Oh, I know what that is. That's Clint Eastwood. Better clear out out the back. Right. 
That's the movie where he kills Gene Hackman. Um, which is, I'm blanking on the title. Shit. Oh, man. I'm forgetting the name of the movie. You have five seconds. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. Ah, <laughs> oh, Christ. Uh, lo it. Lonesome, Lonesome Rider. I don't Wrong. Know. Unforgiven. Unforgiven. Uh, Shit. Ah, oh, man. Come on. Go for it. But I knew what movie it was. Oh. All right. Now, this is the last one. And <laughs> oh. I would be shocked if you didn't get it. Oh, really? No, I saved the last one special. Unforgiven. I just couldn't remember the name of the title, but okay. Well, I, I don't do good clinics. <laughs> how many have you done? How many have I done? I think you? we've each done three. Oh, boy. All right. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get this one. For now on, I want you to put an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. What? How do you not know this? From now on, I want you to put an equal amount of blueberries into each muffin? This is, I'm going to give you a hint. It's a classic, you know, Italian-American cinema. Oh, Italian American cinema. Well, it's not Scorsese. It's not. Uh, I, I can. I, it's not. Uh, wow. Could it be Moonstruck? No, it's, oh, it is Scorsese. It's Casino. Oh, Casino. I don't know that movie that well. Come I don't on, know that well. Come on. You're going to split that with me. I got no, that right. No, I'm not. I'm you not. Fucking bastard. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> now I get to good and drunk. <laughs> Last question. Go ahead. What piece of advice would you give to a filmmaker? What is the most important skill set a filmmaker should have? I would say of the many skills that a filmmaker must have, and this is Sambuca drunk me telling you this right now, is patience. And I mean patience that is interlocked with a um, tenacity to never give up. Um, if you have a film you want to make, you have a, a, a dream, a vision, uh, having the patience, patience to listen, the patience to, to allow other ideas to come and the patience to make the movie when the time is right with the right people. Patience and tenacity are the kind of the two skills that uh, uh, are kind of the two suns that sit in the sky for you as a filmmaker that you must follow. And they're your North Star, if you'll have it. Well, that is some wise and sage advice. Eric, man, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for getting me disgustingly drunk and but <laughs> enjoying it as we talk about cinema. If you don't get disgusted, yeah. If you don't get disgusted, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get drunk on Cinema Vino, you did it wrong. No, that's true. Good, good point. And cut. <laughs>